My regrets look just like texts I shouldn't send And I got neighbors that more like strangers We could be friends I just need a way out Everybody, this is Crystal. Uh, today we are actually launching the pilot episode of The Way We Lived. Um, I've put out a few episodes or videos regarding kind of what I'm doing and the format that's working here. But um, today we're going to kind of talk about my story or one of my stories. What has been the most recent uh, kind of situation in my life. Um, and it's been a major life changer for me. Um, basically, I've got two kids. Uh, one, Jake, he's 24. And my oldest is Zach, he's 29. And uh, Zach actually uh, passed away in April, April 26th of this year, uh, 2019. Um, in one way, it came out of nowhere. And then on the other way, I've been waiting for it. And I know as a parent that just honestly, just for lack of better words, it just sounds shitty. Um, Zach was one of those kids that was just a, a brilliant kid, just a gypsy soul. And um, he struggled quite a bit with um, depression and abandonment issues. Um, the signs really started for him um, more so in middle school. When he was a young boy, he was very outgoing, very much an extrovert, never knew a stranger, um, smart as all could be. And in middle school, I started seeing a change in him where he was a little more introverted and really kind of started suffering depression. Well, me, uh, I was a single mom with these two boys and I just really, I don't want to say that I disregarded it, but at that time I thought, you know, this is puberty, this is normal, and I think boys especially would draw during that time where girls get a little more rebellious. Um, so instead of me really addressing the issues of, you know, the depression and abandonment, I was kind of busy working 80 hours a week trying to support my kids, and I kept thinking it was a phase and he would get through it, and it just progressively evolved and um, towards high school he um, later in high school he was always a really good student but later in high school I found out he was smoking pot which in the big scheme of life I don't think pot's a big deal but he found that outlet and um, it was concerning for me based on what he was going through and discussions that we had had about you know his his depressionary state and his abandonment um, stemmed from his father um, which I put it kind of back on me um, when I was in my early 20s I was kind of a wild child and made a lot of bad decisions for myself and didn't value myself enough uh, to only be with men that were long term or you know relationship material I was just more looking for fun and honestly uh, just not respecting myself uh, so that's a whole nother episode we can get into um, but I just honestly I just didn't give a shit and so I ended up you know with this guy and we dated for a month or so and found out I was pregnant and he wanted nothing to do with it have an abortion was his uh, answer along um, with my father's answer that was his answer just you have your whole life ahead of you don't tie yourself down you're smart don't have a baby and for me personally that wasn't an option um, I am very open to women having their own choices but for me that wasn't a choice uh, I just couldn't do it so I went ahead and proceeded, you know, with pregnancy and was actually very excited about having Zach. Um, his dad just bailed, uh, wasn't in the picture at all, didn't want anything to do with it. And um, so I had Zach and I had a good support system. I mean, I had friends and family, you know, that supported me having him and were very excited about him. And um, 
from the day I had him, I told Zach, I mean, he was, he, he saved my life. He saved me from myself. Uh, the road that I was going down for myself was, was probably not leading to good places. And uh, Zach, you know, definitely put a halt to all that. And I've eternally been grateful to him for um, what he gave me and his childhood and everything. I mean, he was brilliant, he was fun, he was easy to take. Uh, anywhere I went, he met everybody. He was like that cute little puppy you'd take to the park if you were a guy to be a chick magnet. Zach was my dude magnet. <laughs> he met everybody. I think half the guys I dated, Zach, you know, was the one that hooked that up and he was only like three years old, so. Um, but anyway, we, you know, we had our little life together and when he was five, I kind of ended up in that same back scenario where I hooked up with a guy that I dated before and, you know, Jake was produced. So again, you know, wanted to keep my baby. So here I was, single mom of two kids and take it from me, that's a blast. Um, they were awesome, but it's a lot of work. Um, and uh, anyway, so with us, it was always just the three of us. And if you will ever see references on me, the number three with me and my kids was always the thing. When they were in sports, they were number three, 13, 30, 33 on every jersey that you'll ever see them in um, from when they were in school. And I've got tattooed on me the three and the boys had the same, you know. Zach had a tattoo on his back that was um, Phoenix, and that tattoo had mine and Jake's initials on there. And Zach actually got that tattoo when he was 18. And the purpose of the, the tattoo, if you know about a Phoenix, was about rebirth. And Zach was trying to show that he was going from being a boy to a man, and he was rebirthing himself. And, ready to be on his own and Zach moved out the day after he turned 18 and that um, opened up a whole different door between our relationship and our family core um, I ended up not long after that getting uh, married and um, at that same time as when Zach started diving into deeper drugs and pills and I wasn't really sure what he was doing, but I could tell a difference in him. He was not working much. He was um, not as outgoing. He was looking different, not taking care of himself as much because he was always that guy that took two showers a day and Mr. GQ looking. And, you know, he was kind of letting himself go a little bit. So I really started noticing these changes and trying to address with him, like, what's going on with you? I know, I can tell. And always, Mom, I've got this, I've got this. And when he was probably about 22, I started seeing more significant changes. Um, he'd go to the bathroom and be in there for 30, 45 minutes, you know, always complaining of these stomach aches and always sleepy and I was in denial about what he was doing I kept hoping hoping you know that it was too much weed or maybe he had taken a few too many Xanax um, but I've started finding signs that he had kind of gone into heavier type drugs and in the midst of that time I was married and my ex-husband was an addict and I was very determined that I wasn't gonna go through another divorce. And I submerged myself in my home life crisis situation. And I feel, I feel a lot of guilt um, for what's happened with Zach. I feel like I was so caught up in, in my own world between my addict husband and my, and then at the time, 13, 14 year old Jake and the chaos that was in my household because it was utter hell. Um, I was so focused in myself and my world, I felt like I 
neglected Zach. Even though I asked if he would move in with us, I tried to get him into rehab. I mean, he spent like a week stint in a hospital that basically what he had done was just done so much drugs and he had just deteriorated his system and his, um, you know, his defense mechanisms were just, he wasn't fighting off infection anymore. And he developed an infection that a doctor literally told me he would never walk again. And, um, you know, then we tried to start him into treatments and I started going with him to like nar Narcon, uh, or I don't, I'm not sure, nar Narcotics Anonymous meetings and things like that. And my personal opinion of some of those programs is they, I don't know, if you, you really have to get into the right one. Um, but I supported him and I went with him. And I tried, I tried my best um, to always be an open ear. I never, ever, ever, not one time, rejected my child. Um, I, I was a tough love parent, but I wasn't going to kick him to the curb. He didn't have anybody. Um, the only other family he had that he was, and I'm grateful for them, um, the Scholes family, uh, his best friend Quincy, um, which there's a whole other story between Quincy and I that we'll do another episode on. Uh, it's interesting. But Quincy's family would take Zach in when he was at his, his low. They would make sure that he wasn't homeless. They would feed him. Uh, Quincy's mom, Zach, always bragged about her and loved her and adored her and Quincy's sister and Q, you know. Um, that was his second family. And because of my feelings of Quincy's interaction with all this, I pushed back. I never really made an effort, you know, to be close to them because I had some anger and resentment underlying about some of that. Um, but they did, I look back now and see how much that they did take care of my son. Um, but fast forward a little bit and Zach had moved to Chile for a year and he seemed to do better when he lived away and when he came back he um, started using heroin and the signs were there uh, I was in denial Jake was in denial but we were just I mean we were finding stuff spoons and syringes and things you mix with and um, there was just no denying it and I kept trying to talk about it to Zach and you know, mom, I got this. It, it isn't what you think. And, you know, it's it's just opium or it's, you know, always that excuse that that addict uses because they're, they feel shame and they want to protect the people that they love and they don't want to admit that they're using. And I'm telling you, if you are an addict, I know that your mind doesn't work right. I had a husband that was an addict and a son that was an addict. And I know that the brain plays tricks on you. And I know that you think that you're helping with lying. And if there's one thing that I can ask of you is just stop that bullshit. Because you're not, nobody's believing you. The symptoms are all over you. They can see it in the, the way your eyes change and the, the way your facial expressions change when you talk and the way your eyes are drooped half closed and and the things that you say that are just utterly not the truth and there's all these things that the addict mind just sees differently and so when you're sitting there lying to somebody that you love just know it's bullshit and they know it's bullshit so just cut it out and be honest because the only way you're gonna get help is to be honest and that was the one thing that my child just could not do. He could not face me and say, Mom, I'm actively using. And I, I know because our relationship was so close and he knew he had, Zach had, Zach had so much pride for me. And, and I know this. And he was so proud of the way that I raised them and, and the, the work that I did to provide for them and buy them a house and make sure they had nice clothes. And, you know, I 
I busted my ass as a mom and um, I wasn't always home for them. They had to, Zach had to partially raise Jake and um, you know, they were he was a latchkey, latchkey kid, you know. Um, not proud of that, but I had to do what I had to do. And um, because of that, I feel a lot of guilt. Um, and as close as Zach and I were in the deep conversations that we could have, this was one that even as understanding as I was about it or tried to be, he still felt judgment um, because he knew that obviously I wasn't cool with him shooting a needle in his arm. Um, so again, that addict mind, you know, you don't, you don't want to feel judged. You want to do what you want to do and you really don't. You don't want anybody giving you shit about it. And you don't want to get help until you're ready to get help. And Zach, like most addicts, think they got this. And that they can handle it on their own. And he couldn't. I mean, before he left, he moved to California a little over two years ago. And before he left, I, I know he was still using, wasn't sure completely what. I think a lot of it was pills. Um but I know he wasn't completely clean. But when he went to California, I think that was, at that time, in hindsight, it seemed like the best thing that was for him. Austin was a very bad place for him because his connections were too easy. It was too easy for him to get stuff. He was too much in that scene, in that culture, and he wasn't strong enough to pull himself out of it. So he moved to California and, um, the first year he was there, he was living in Santa Rosa and was in an environment where he was around other people. Um, he was growing weed. I mean, they say do what you love and it doesn't seem like work and that's what he did. I mean, he was a weed grower and he loved it. He was fascinated with it and he was doing really well. And um, Jake and I went to um, see him and that was, for me in my life, that trip of just me and my two boys was the most beautiful trip I've ever had. Um, and we really enjoyed our time together and it was really good to see Zach in his element. He looked amazing. He had gained weight. His eyes were bright and vibrant and he was excited. And I knew, as his mom, I knew he was clean. Um, he came home for Christmas a few weeks later and um, brought a friend with him and they had a beautiful trip and I knew he was clean. I knew it. And so when he went back to California, he had a different opportunity where he was going to be living up on the mountain. And I think that whole experience really changed him. Um, he was very isolated. Uh, he lived up there primarily by himself. He had a couple of neighbors that were uh, these guys from Mexico that didn't speak English and Zach spoke fluent Spanish so he befriended them and um, those were the only really interactions he had. Um, a friend of his, a quote friend of his, ended up going and living with him on the mountain. Um, but I've heard and I've had many people tell me that living up there will literally drive a person insane. And I could hear through the time changes in Zach. Um, the way he sounded, depression was setting in again, loneliness was setting in for him. He missed home, he missed his friends, he missed his family, he missed his brother, me, his grandma, our family gatherings, just our life. And uh, his plan was to stay in California for five years because he wanted to make enough money to come home and build me a house and buy his brother a car he wanted to do for us and so our family had this little cohesive plan you know for him and for us and we just took care of each other you know During that time, I don't know if Zach was using heroin or not. Um, he kept telling me he was clean, and in my heart, I want to believe that he was. When he came home, he usually would come home for Christmas for a month or so. 
And when he came home this Christmas, he looked a little bit different to me. He looked like he had aged significantly. Um, but it didn't look so much to me like drug aging. It looked like loneliness and sadness aging or maybe the terrain where he was living in. I mean, they didn't even have running water or anything like that. Um, but I could tell he was different. Something was different in him. And he came home at Christmas and he was gonna go for a trip. He did go to Japan and Vietnam. He was gone for a month there, but he was supposed to come back. And then he and I were supposed to go to Mexico City and then Jake and I were supposed to go to California and we had all these trips planned for this year. And then on Easter Sunday, I'm out with my friends and um, we're at dinner and I get a, I through the day gotten a text from Zach, you know, and I said, well, honey, I'm with some friends and I'll call you later. And a little bit later, he called me and I was thinking like, what's up? What's up with him? Something's, something's not right. So I, I called him back and the tone of his voice was just so different and I could tell he was just so sad and it was just mom I just I just want you to know I love you and that resonates with me still because that conversation was the last time that I talked to him that I heard his voice um, come to find out he had called my mom that day with the same message or the same you know reason so fast forward four days um, I did text him on Monday about just something stupid but fast forward to Thursday I mean Friday um, April 26 and I'm driving home from work and talking to my mom on the phone. I'm always yapping on the phone as I drive either to my mom or to my best friend, Lauren. And um, I'm talking to my phone and I hear somebody clicking in and I disregard it. A little bit later, it clicks in again, disregard it. And a text came in. So I look at the phone and I see it's from Patrick and that's one of Zach's, I'll call him friends. Um, Anyway, I hadn't heard from Patrick in years. And he calls me, I, I need you to call me immediately. And I knew, and I knew. And I will tell you why I knew. I'm gonna kinda have to back up. Four years ago, when I, Zach had come home from Chile, and I suspicioned that he was using heroin then and he wouldn't ever admit it, um, there was, several scenarios where Jake was finding stuff. The boys were living together and Jake confronted him. So we all kind of knew that each other knew, but Zach wasn't coming clean about it. And there was a night that Zach and, and his friend Quincy and Quincy's friend had all gone out to dinner. Jake was home with his friends at the apartment and Zach came in with his friends. And they were there for a minute. Well, out of nowhere, Zach needs to go take a shower. So Zach's in there for like 45 minutes. And um, there was a knock at the door and there's somebody, I think, for Zach. And Jake's like beating on the bathroom door. Zach, you know, somebody's here for you. No answer. No answer. Jake could hear the water running. No response. Well, they kicked in the bathroom door. And they found Zach and he had overdosed. He was dead. His heart had stopped. This is his little brother and his Zach's best friend. And they cleared everybody out of the apartment. They got Zach out and Quincy's friend knew CPR and they basically beat the shit out of his chest and they brought him back. And apparently bounced out of it just like nothing ever happened. Let me tell you how much trauma that caused his little brother. Jake will never get past that image of his brother. Luckily, 
Jake and Quincy were able to bring him back and gave me four more years with my son. Um, the day when Patrick called me, there's no other reason for Patrick to call me other than trouble. And uh, so when I called him back, his first thing, Crystal, has anybody contacted you? And I said, no. I said, he's dead, isn't he? Isn't he, Patrick? And he just started just crying. Yes, ma'am. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Crystal. What happened? They think he overdosed. I said, Where are you? Well, I'm on the way to the mountain, down the mountain now. I said, you're in California? You know, I thought he was in Austin. Yes, yeah, so I've been up here with Zach. Okay, well you, you get down there as quick as you can and I'm just like in shock. I wasn't crying. I just remember just not being able to breathe. And um, I said, just get down the mountain. As soon as you get to him, call me back. So I call my mom back and I'm screaming hysterically and hyperventilating. And I'm on 183, luckily only three exits up from my house. And I just, I went paralyzed from head to toe. I went paralyzed and I'm, my mom got me through it, got me home. I got home. I had to call Jake at work, tell him his brother died, called my friends and we went from there. Um, I will tell you it's been four months later and I still cannot wrap my head around the fact that I will never see my beautiful son again. I will never hear him call me mama because that's what he called me. It's what all his friends called me. And the way he said it, the tone that he said it in was just so specific to me. And, and probably where I'm at now and, and where I want to go in this because there's a lot there in the middle that maybe, you know, having to make funeral arrangements for my kid and I honestly didn't have to do too much because the minute that I told my friends that my son had died, they took it. Uh, Robert and Lauren and Lisa and Kara and Lynn and my mom and Wendy and there's just so many, too many to name, but they took it. They raised money for me. The guys and the music scene pulled together and my friends literally picked me up and carried me through the worst experience that I've ever had in my life. And if it wasn't for them, oh, I can't even imagine. They raised money for me to bring my son home from California. Everybody, I don't even know who donated. Kara just told me every person you know donated money. I've never seen the list. I don't even know how much was, I don't know, um, but I was able to bring him home and have a, the most beautiful service. The venue was donated to me by Ernie, the owner, and it just could not have been more perfect. My friends played, and next to the day that I brought Zach into this world, I think the day that we said goodbye to him was the most beautiful, perfect day of my life even under the sadness that was there. Um, the love that I felt for me and my kids, it was overwhelming and it's still been overwhelming since that time. Um, my little core circle has just <laughs> put me in a bubble. Uh, Nate, Robert, Lauren, Trish, um, they just protect me. Um, I don't go out a lot 
I don't go out really unless Nate is with me because I can divert my unhappiness to him and he makes me feel safe. And so you probably see pictures of me on Facebook and I'm laughing and having a great time because with my core and in that moment, I can forget. I don't forget my son, but I can forget the hell that is going on inside of me. Um, for those of you that have lost a child, you know that literally it rips out a part of your body. And for those that say time will heal this, time isn't going to do shit. It isn't going to bring my kid back. It isn't going to fill this hole. It is just going to keep going. Um, life moves forward and I think it's just seeing that that you know that you can't just crawl up in a ball as much as I would love to you can't just crawl up in a ball and not go anymore and I know my kid was a gypsy soul he would have said mom okay you need to cry for me for a bit <laughs> because you know it's me and I want you to be sad for a minute um, but honestly, if, if, if I know Zach, he would tell me, quit your damn job and live the life that I lived and travel and free up the responsibilities that you have in your life because money really doesn't mean a damn thing and live. Go be with your friends and be with your family and do the things that you love to do and the money will come. And don't think that a day doesn't go by that I don't think about that. Um, where I'm at mentally since this time, you know how I, I think of Robin Williams a lot through this. Um, how funny and charismatic he was and how everybody looked to him to be that person for them. We as a people needed him, you know, to make us laugh. And so on the outside, he was able to paint this picture and this smile and do things. But with that mindset that all that was for everybody else. When, you know, you kind of look at him and think that he got pleasure in that or was doing that too. And now, you know, I look at people in a different way in a deeper light and I look at, at him specifically and I see just the sadness that was inside of him and knowing since Zach's died how I can talk to certain people and I can see the awkwardness that it brings to them. They don't know what to do. Death is such an uncomfortable topic and you know well I'm so sorry this happened to you and is there anything I can do for you? Well, unless you can bring my kid back, no, there's really not. Just listen, just be there. Just be there because there's going to be days where I'm crawling out of my skin. There's going to be days where I don't want to talk to any damn body and I don't want anybody getting upset or hurt about that. There's going to be days that I'm angry and abrasive and maybe do sound a little judgmental and that you know you're screwing up your life and quit being such a dipshit because like this is how it can turn out and there's days where I'm self-sabotaging and that I'm making my own mistakes because I don't want this crap in my head anymore um, the first probably two months after he died I would say I was numb um, I mean I was sad and I was crying but I wasn't processing um, and I wasn't experiencing the loneliness as much because I went back to work like a week and a half, two weeks maybe after he died and you know I was having everybody call and constantly checking on me and so that you know you've got this constant turmoil you know that you're dealing with and I had a lot of stuff that I was dealing with just surrounding his death and things that just don't make sense to me because Zach was not using I mean he was clean and everybody in California tells me 
he had been clean for two years. Why would he use? And and the crazy part of it is he was terrified of fentanyl. He was a heroin user and fentanyl had been mixed in his heroin and it was the fentanyl that killed him. The, the amount of heroin he used was barely enough, the coroner told me barely enough to get him high. And um, so, you know, I'm processing all this other outside stuff that you just got to deal with when people die. But as far as my own emotions in my own place, that was a mess. And I was just stuffing that mess. Like, I didn't want to talk about it because I didn't want to scare anybody. I knew people were worried about me and my friends were concerned and my boyfriend and my kid, you know, Jake and... I didn't want I didn't want to tell them the dark hole and the dark places that I was going to. And I'm sure if you've been grieving anybody's death, then you know. I mean, you know the the it isn't even a sense of loneliness that I felt because I didn't have Zach in my life day in and day out. Um we talked all the time. We communicated all the time, but I wasn't physically seeing him except for, you know, maybe one month a year and then a weekend here and there. Um, but it was that sense. There was the three of us, and one of us is missing now. Like, we were a unit that, I mean, I know families are close, and, and but the, the, where it was with us is we, felt like we, I mean, we obviously had my mom in, in my family, but as far as depending on anybody else to get us through whatever else, the three of us took care of each other. And when Zach died, I felt like I hugely um, allowed something to happen that shouldn't have happened. That I felt that it was my responsibility to keep my kid alive and that I should have done whatever that was if that meant bringing him back and just sticking him in a box, you know? Maybe I should have done that, but that wasn't the type of parent I was. I, I was never one of those over the top, um, over protective kind of parents. I wanted my kids to live and to experience and and make their own decisions for themselves and, and learn themselves how to pull themselves out of situations with my help, but I wasn't going to do that for them. And I started having resentment at myself over my own stubbornness as to what a tough love type of parent that I was and did I make a mistake and should I not have been that way and I, I mean I just started second guessing every component of raising my boys and I started having an extreme amount of guilt over my life choices you know had I not been sleeping with some dude that I didn't really give a damn about then I never would have had this baby for him to reject you know and and my son would have never grown up listening or having that abandonment in his life and not only did I put that on one child, I put that on two children that grew up without fathers that wanted and yearned for something that I couldn't give them. But me being me, I shit, I got this. I can do this. I can raise two boys. I can give them everything they need. I mean, you know, I can give them my love that I give them will be enough. And let me tell you, single moms, it ain't always enough. Uh, it's just not. And, you know, all of you that maybe have an ex that is a dipshit and you think is it's better off without him being in their lives, you might want to rethink that. Because even my boys' dads, we weren't on the greatest terms, but if I had to go back and do it all over again, I would have probably changed some of that a little bit. And I always had an open door if they wanted to come into the life, but they didn't for the most part. And um, so 
you know. So anyway, I feel I, I just go through a lot of guilt. But with where I'm at now and where I've been over these past three months or four months, there was a very dark place that I went into. And um, all I wanted in my head was to know, was to be with Zach, like where he is now. I see him not as dead. I see him just in some other place, some other side. And I went through probably a couple of weeks of really wanting to be in that other side. And um, I've never been one to use hard drugs. And that was never anything that um, I ever even dreamt about or was curious about or anything like that. And in that pain that I was feeling that was so deep, I just kept thinking, what will eliminate this pain? What will do it? And I started thinking about Zach, who I always wondered with Zach, like, why do you stick a needle in your arm? Why would you do that to yourself? Why would you risk dying over a drug, you know? Now I get it. Like, now I get it. When you feel pain like this, and there's there's no coming out of it. This isn't like going through a divorce where two or three years later you find love again. There will never be something that replaces this. There will never be another person that fills this side of my heart. Zach was truly my first, the first love of my life, Zach was. And there's nothing that gets that back. And you get your head into a place where you want to be with, connected, you know, to that person. And I'm going to tell you, the only place my head kept going was to try what he tried, you know. And like if heroin would get me to that place maybe I should try it and I'm gonna tell you I contemplated shit for two weeks one weekend I was just it's all I could think about and luckily I came through it um, I didn't use I didn't go there I didn't contact anybody I didn't find what I wanted or what I thought I wanted but it was a really dark place and so maybe when you're seeing people out and they've gone through just a lot of shit and they've got that smile on their face you need to really sit back and look sometimes at really what's going on and maybe just take a minute and talk to them People aren't always what they think, and they're not always who they appear. There's a lot of people out there that are just damaged and hurting, and they cover it up with a beautiful, radiant smile, or a joke, or a funny personality, or music. Um, but they've got a story, and what I'm trying to do and accomplish here with the life we lived is allowing people to tell those stories so that maybe through their heartaches and their tribulations you can see that there is a journey that we all take sometimes it ends up in a better scenario and sometimes you just gotta learn to just cope with it and like with the death of my son Jake and I, my family, we're just trying to learn to get to the sunshine again. I mean, and, and, and to find the sunshine that we can carry Zach with us, but that we can still feel the warmth and the happiness and have a, br a, a brighter place for us. So I hope um, this kind of explains a little bit. This whole, this whole effort, it's a tribute to Zach. The logo, that phoenix, that's a tattoo on his back. Every Everything that Nate and I have created with this, because Nate's been helping me, has been 
either part of Zach or part of Jake or part of me. This is our family, my unit, the three of us together, no matter what. And us trying to bring what we've been through and for me to feel like Zach's death. I hate saying was for a purpose because as far as I'm concerned, no. But if it can help one person, one person to stop and look at their life a little bit differently for any reason, not for just addiction, for just for decision making or depression or just even just secluding yourself, don't. Reach out, make friends, find love in your life find happiness, travel, find joy, live, do the one thing that my kid did that I envied so much. He just lived. So with that, I'm going to close up and um, we're going to do this on a weekly basis and I'm going to be interviewing some people and some episodes are going to be a little tough and some of them will hopefully be lighthearted. And uh, this won't just be a cry fest every week, but just know that it comes from a place of love and that it's one way of my family, me and my two boys, just trying to make Zach's life something that I'm deeply proud of, but maybe something that you can find some pride of too and maybe build a friendship with somebody that you ever even never even knew because he was just the coolest guy just the coolest guy for those that didn't know him you missed out have a great day love you guys don't you know that sunshine don't feel bright when you're inside all day i wish it was nice out but it looked like Skies are drifting, not living forever. They told me it only gets better. My regrets look just like texts I shouldn't send. And I got neighbors that more like strangers.